Oh shit! I know what's going on. I know what's going on. Don't Boom. leave us. I made it too long. I made oh. it a little too long. That's okay. I had to redo the intro. I had to remove a couple parts and put a couple new things in there. Shri, I don't know if you noticed, but you were in there. Your little cool dance. Uh, how's everybody doing tonight? It is Sunday night, December Sunday. something, nineteenth. Man, Sunday. one week till Christmas, and you may be wondering why the heck are we starting at seven thirty? I've been wanting to cover so many topics lately that I can't get them squished into an hour. Who knows? Maybe next Sunday we're going to start at seven and this becomes a two hour show. We'll see. I don't know. I know that the great podcasters like Dana Leash, Dana Lish, whatever Lash. Her name, Dana Lash, Dana Lash, she goes for three hours cool. because there's so much to cover. And today, this first half an hour, I want to cover an introduction to opiates. What the heck are they? Where did they come from? And how long has this epidemic been going on? And then I want to tie that into this recent epidemic you currently are witnessing where 145 people or so every single day are dying. Every three weeks, as many people were lost at 9-11 are dying every three weeks due to overdose and opioids, right? Since 1990, since 1995, 96 to right now, over 500,000 people have died due to opiate withdraw or I mean due to opiate overdose. Uh real quick, can I get a mic check? Everything looking good? Okay, great topic. So, yeah. Oh, and don't forget about John Ventura, The Venture Forward. Every Wednesday or well, I don't even know what the days are now. You didn't I, even put a day in there, John. I always I could it <laughs> sucks cuz I cannot we with the our the time that we go to our local group, John's live, and it's like I can't do. It sucks. Every once in a while, I get to catch his, but make sure you tune into the Venture Forward. Great content, great stuff. But today, that's what we're going to talk about for this first half hour. The second half hour, we're going to get back into our book, staying sober, and continue down the path of relapse syndrome. What the heck is it? We know that relapse syndrome equals post acute withdrawal. Minus symptom management, right? You got post acute withdrawal. You feel like you're crazy. It's your first year in sobriety. Why do I feel nuts? Why can't I concentrate? Why don't I have energy? Why do one day I feel like I'm going to cry? The next day I feel so excited and happy. I don't know what to do. And I'm learning how to manage that. If you don't manage those symptoms, that gets you into a relapse mindset and the end is inevitable uh, using drugs, which relapse begins way before that. In this book, we just learned that it's like walking up a down escalator. You can't stop moving forward. And it's like that in life in general. You want to continue to grow and educate and become a better person. You can't stop moving forward. You got to continue Don't to go stop, that way. It, it. So I'm going to let Fleece say hi to everybody while I pull this up. And then we're going to look at a brief history of opiates and how far back they really go. And then we're going to touch on the Sackler family and go from there. All right, update on JV. Tuesdays and Thursdays, 8 p.m. Eastern. VF Talks, Friday, 6.30 Eastern time. Thanks, John. Go check him out because he is awesome. I'll just say a quick hello. We got Brad as first one here. Whoop, whoop. Uh, I think he's on the road. Yeah, it says he got here at 321, and it's like 7. <laughs> he's been waiting for four hours. Amanda Cook. Good he's, to see you. He's ya. driving. Brad's driving. He's, he gets to go visit Nicole. Lucky. Oh, he's going to visit Nicole again? Yeah, so lucky. What? Jealous. I know, right? We're going. It's official. What's up, Crystal? Good to see you here. Cherie, loved your little spot in our new intro because you're amazing. Yeah. Did, did she see it, I hope? I hope so. If I not, hope rewind it. it. Rewind if not, it. rewind and watch the, the, watch the intro. What's up, Jim? That I'm going to have to fix. Our hillbilly Jim. Says, how do you recover, warriors? Is the only thing prettier than a hillbilly sunset? Love y'all. <laughs> <laughs> Sub Jess, good to have you here. I dropped a whole bunch of links. So if you go back up to the top of the chat, you'll see them all. Click those and join us in Discord, Facebook, subscribe to our YouTube, yada, yada, yada. And yeah. who else? Matt, oh, look, I'm behind. Debbie's here. Welcome. Desmond, happy birthday. Ah, oh, 19 years of sobriety for Des. Woo! Amazing. 19 years. And you know what he's still doing? He still comes to the groups. He still goes to meetings. He still gets involved in recovery. He reminds himself of where he was so that he doesn't go back there. And he does this every day for the last 19 years. And that's how he's able to stay sober. It's amazing. It is. And he's super cool. If you were ever in the Discord and in our Zoom meetings, Des Dr. Awesome, Des, because he's awesome. If I have like a newcomer that's like got a day 
Like I've been clean one day. Is there somebody I could talk to? If I could get him to talk to Des every time, I would send him right that way. Yep. What's up, Mad? Mad, also very cool. Mad's awesome. Too. Same with Leslie. Thank you guys for all the stuff you do in the Discord. Yeah. We super, super appreciate it. Uh, 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 uh. Hey, Bill, backstage. Can you hear me? Give me a thumbs up if you What's can. What's up, Nicole? Jealous okay, that you cool. and Brad get to hang out. Boo. But cool. <laughs> <laughs> What's up, Granite Cat? Also, Granite Cat. Oh, uh, he's awesome, too. Man. Great one for the Discord. What's up, Jesse? And John is right, man. Meeting makers make it. That's true. That's He's true. a shining example of that. He Geesh. says he loves you, brother. Well, shout out to Geesh. Shout out to Geesh. Man, Geesh, I don't want to throw your stuff out there, but the way that you handled high risk situations, the way that you handled high stress, the way that you reached out, talked about it, and continued to stay in the tribe, in the clan, in the group, and let it be known your frustrations and exactly how you're feeling. I love Nicole's little input to you. Hey, don't worry about it. Let it out. You got to walk around all pissed off. Be that way for a minute. We're here for you. We don't care. We'll watch you cuss at the wall for a minute. That's what we do. You know, and us addicts, we get up frustrated. And, and if you can do that in front of a group and let it all out, and we're here to just surround you with love and say, we got your back. And then it goes away. It gets better and easier. So, Geish, you're a shining example of how to pick up a phone when it weighs a thousand pounds. Yes. And, and let us know what's going on. Very Using true. the Discord exactly as it's been designed. Exactly. So cool. What's up, Diana? Diana, what's up? Congratulations Marie? to Steve. Crad con yeah, congrats to Steve. Graduating some college. He's an educated man. <laughs> yes, That's he awesome. is. So cool. Something Oop. I don't think I will ever do. Richard Brannon, the veteran in the Phoenix VA. I'm no longer in VA system. I'm still in recovery in the civilian side of it. No more poor me working the steps with the sponsor for months claim. Yes. Yeah, right, so Richard. Cool. No more poor me. That's kind of like goes right along with step one mm -hmm. <laughs> no more poor me i love it so cool glad you're here exactly. bud. exactly all right all right check this out Skin so here this. is a history of the opiates now we're only going to be looking at 1775 because that's when opiates finally made it to the united states they go way back further way 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 back before christ like 460 years before christ opiates have been used okay opiates and the reason i want to go back this far in history and look at opiates is because the consensus around how dangerous this drug is, how addictive this drug is, has been known for 3,000 years, like three, <laughs> literally 3,000 years of history of how dangerous this drug is. So in 1775, opiates made its way into the, U the United States. In 1860, you see that it's being it started commonly being used to treat soldiers in the Civil War, right? 400,000 of those received morphine for pain, and then they became addicted. Back in 1860, they said, hey, this drug is awesome for, for stopping pain. Gave it to the Civil War guys, you know, they got hit in the leg with a cannon. They're all hurt and painful, you know, and then boom, war's over. 400,000 of the dudes still addicted to opiates, okay, opioids. So in the late 1800s, sharp rises in opioid addiction. We've seen it right in the 1800s, sharp rise in addiction. It occurs due to the increase of the over-the-counter availability of this drug, oh. right? Bear, you've heard of Bear for headaches and all that kind of stuff. That brand, they, begin, they began selling heroin for pain relief and coughs. Oh, you got a cough here? Have some heroin. <laughs> Back then, it was just a medicine. They yeah. Were, they were like, well, it works. Here you go. See, and that's the thing, man. We don't want nobody to be in pain. And we obviously, pain sucks and we need to take something for our pain. And there's no better pain reliever than an opiate, straight from the poppy seed. And we'll get into what an opiate is right after this, once we understand kind of how this epidemic has been going on a lot longer than the last 25 years. So early in the 1900s, morphine and pain management enter the scene, right? Pain management, that's a key word in this little thing. In 1910, Americans were crushing it and smoking it, right? Just like they were over in China. And then in 1914, Harrison Narcotics Act made opioids available only by prescription to limit recreational use. And then you get into 1920 to 1950s in an attempt to avoid addiction. Opioids are only prescribed for what? To the dying and acute pain rather than for chronic pain. They're like, you know what? Uh, I think there's a thing here with opiates. They're super addictive and dangerous. And if you take too much, you either become super addicted or you die. So let's not prescribe these to anybody except if they're dying 
or have cancer and this crazy extreme acute pain. But if you got a, a hurt knee, you know, pain's not always bad, you know. In 1970, with strong stigmas and increased fears associated with opioid addiction, doctors turned to surgeries to block for nerve blocking operations and other non-pharmaceutical meta- methods to relieve chronic pain. So way back in the 70s, they're like, you know what? Instead of prescribing opiates, let's uh, get inside the body, cut the nerve that's making you feel like you're in pain so that you don't feel the pain, right? They're doing operations to block nerves so that they don't have to prescribe opiates. This is in the 70s. Then in 1970 to 1990, the American Pain Association advocated for pain relief, a specifically a non-addictive treatment for cancer-related pain. And then in 76 to 86, you see Percocet and Vicodin on the scene. Why? Because they were approved by the FDA. And then in 1986, the World Health Organization creates guidelines for treating cancer pain, recommending opioid use only if there are no other options available. Still up to 1986, if you're dying, you're on your deathbed, there's no other options, here's some opiates, you know. Go out of this world in peace and, and painless. And then, then what happens? Welcome Purdue Pharma to the scene. 1998. <laughs> Purdue Pharma puts on the market in 1996, actually, uh, Oxycontin. A lot of people know that word and that term very well. Purdue Pharma spent $207 million on Oxycontin marketing. And that's what I want to talk about is because as soon as we get to this talking about the Sackler family and the evil greed behind this family that owned Purdue before they let it go bankrupt after getting three felonies, still to this day deny that, oh, we didn't know that it was going to have that effect on people. We had no idea. We thought, you know, making it a time release thing was going to make it non-addictive. Bullcrap. We've known this since before Jesus was here, that opiates are dangerous and can be very, very addictive and kill you. And that's kind of why we want to go through this whole history, because these guys are playing dumb as they're sitting on $11 billion dollars and not taking any personal responsibility for the last two decades and 500,000 deaths that they that they helped these people get on this medication through bribes and $207 million on marketing. Do you know what marketing is? That's telling people that it's okay to use this, that it's not addictive. That's paying bribes. That's getting doctors to do things. That's paying sales reps to go out and push your drugs. These guys went from, you know, heroin's like, Mexican mafia, you got Cubans and all this mafia selling drugs and bringing it over the border, guns, crime. And then you got these guys in suits doing the exact same thing on a way bigger money scale. In 1997 to 2002, morphine prescriptions increased by 73%. Okay. That is insane. Hydromorphine increases by 96%. Fentanyl prescriptions increased by 226%. And oxycodone prescriptions increased by 402%. There's this. It's insane. Yeah. That's nuts. There's this little, little wave, right? Like, oh, here's how the prescriptions go. Oh, here comes Purdue and their marketing tactics. Boom. Spike in prescriptions. Doctors are like, like this. Here you go. Oh, your toe hurts. Here you go. Oh, you just fell off a thing. Here you go. Oh, your back hurts. Oh, you know, and the, and the doctors are getting money kickbacks, getting, they're going to parties and cruises and all this kind of stuff, all because of what Purdue is pushing. In the mid 2000, in the mid 2000s, oh, we're looking at 2001 now, medical centers are required to examine their patients' pain levels. I don't know if you remember going into the doctors before the year 2000. Doctor just comes in, checks your vitals, right? Because they were able to list as the fifth vital um, measurement that they want to take on you is now pain. The first four were always body temperature, pulse rate, respiration rate, right? How are you? Are you hot? Are you cold and dead? Let's let's check your vitals. Uh, What's your blood rate? Your pulse rate, right? Is your heart beating? Uh, Another thing was the rate of breathing. Are you still breathing good? You're getting oxygen. This is stuff the body needs to live. And then blood pressure, even though blood pressure is not considered a vital sign, but it's often measured along with all the other vital signs. In the 2000s, this term uh, pain management enters the scene and doctors are now required to ask a patient 
what his pain levels are. What's and your all pain of us level said, from one to 10. Yeah, what's your pain level? You see this little sign come out. You see him on the walls from zero to 10. And the little face that's smiling all the way to number 10 that's super grimaced, you know? what? What? Where are you at on this scale, you know? And, and, that, and now we're pointing at, a, pointing at a thing, telling them how much pain we're in so that they can get ready to get their pad out and write prescriptions. In the mid-2000s, the commonality of teens starting to use opioids after finding prescription medications in their parents' bathroom is first reported. Uh-oh. And then 2010, from pills to heroin, right? All of a sudden, Oxycontin's on the street. It's too expensive. But guess what? The Mexican mafia is right there to deliver. Here's some cheap black tar heroin for you. And now you're so addicted to opiates that, okay, I'll do it. Not a big deal. 2013, 27,000 plus drug-dependent babies are born. 2013, let me say that one more time. 27,000 plus drug-dependent babies being born. Natal abstinence syndrome. Right? What does that say? Neon? Neonatal abstinence syndrome. Neonatal abstinence syndrome. Man. 2015, national records of overdose deaths grow to 52,404. I love this part right here. 2016, Surgeon General Vivek Murthy reports, for far too long, people have thought about addiction as a character flaw or a moral failing. Addiction is a chronic disease of the brain, and it is one that we have to treat the way that we would any other chronic illness with skill, compassion, and urgency. The reason that he had to write this and wrote this is because the Sackler family, they're saying, oh, no, Oxycontin's safe. Look, we made it time release. The FDA even says, you know, it's not going to be as addictive because of this time release. The reason that people are getting so addicted is because they're drug addict, piece of crap, barrel, bottom of the barrel, you know, pieces of craps. That's basically what Sackler said. If you go look at his comments, they have it. It's not us. It's the addict. Yeah. He would say, if you take it as prescribed, you will not become an addict. And then the whole, was it, uh. They did a whole investigation on, I think if you've seen Dope Sick or the documentary, but they found all these people taking it as prescribed, becoming addicted. Whoop, surprise there. Yeah. It's crazy. From history's earliest civilizations to today, societies have been faced with balancing the medical properties of opiates in treating pain with the euphoric effects that have induced its misuse and abuse. You know, and I kind of feel bad for doctors because the doctor's main thing is to look at a person, right? And this person standing in front of them, pale, pain. Think about the worst pain you've been in. I think the worst pain I've been in is when I've torn my ACL. You know, and I can imagine myself standing in front of a doctor asking for pain relief. And now this doctor has to decide, is this person really in pain or is this a drug addict wanting to get high? Because both can be very convincing. And so the doctor's duty and his ethical duty is to help people's lives be better and feel better, right? And all of a sudden they're confronted with these people that are, how do you tell the difference between an, somebody that's an addict and somebody that's actually in pain? That's true. Oh, you put me on the spot and I'm a blank. <laughs> this. Oh, yeah. Uh, I was written Oxycontin after a car wreck and was instantly hooked. Long story short, I couldn't afford Oxycontin and switched to heroin, fentanyl, but thank God I've been sober for over a year now. Yeah, Laura. Oh, that's awesome. And that's exactly what we've seen time and time again since 1996. Doctors are like, oh, you stubbed your toe. Here, have a 30 milligram Oxycontin in case there's breakthrough pain. You know, on a level of one to 10, what do you need? Here you go. Fill the bottle. Bottle runs out. You're going through withdrawals. Heroin's cheaper and easier to get. And Bob's your uncle, right? You're doing, you're shooting heroin up down the street. And then this opiate, what it does to your brain, it completely changes the wiring, the chemical compounds of what's going on inside your brain. So to get off of heroin, to be a survivor of a heroin addiction is one of the most amazing things that I can imagine right now. Yeah, for sure. Like if you need to take Matt or medicated assisted treatment to get off of it, then by all means, do what I'm you got to do it because you take it for as long as you need it, get off of it. And then hopefully, you know, you never go back. This stuff has quite the hold on a person. 
Yeah, so the earliest reference references to opium, right? The natural source of opiates. So this comes from the poppy plant. The poppy seed grows. There's a bulb at the top. They scrape the side of it. It leaks out some fluid. You scrape that fluid, and from that fluid, you can get the opiates, right? That's going to numb you. Uh, so you can smoke it. You can put it in pills. And that dates all the way back to 3,400 years ago, 3,400 BC, even farther back than that, when poppies were cultivated in lower Mesopotamia. The Samaritans called the opium poppy. This is the name that the Samaritans used for it. Holgul, Holgil. And that stands for the joy plant. Hmm. Right? Hippocrates, the father of medicine, acknowledged opium's usefulness as a narcotic, and he prescribed drinking the juice of the white poppy mixed with the seed of the nettle to relieve pain. Alexander the Great took opium with him as he expanded his empire. Arabs and Greeks and Romans used it as a sedative. In the 15th and 16th centuries, Arabic traders brought opium from far east from their opium-made from there, opium made its way to Europe, where it was used to as a cult as a curative for a wide variety of illnesses and psychological problems. Give opiate here, have some opiates. And then in the 1800s, 1806, German chemist Frederick Wilhelm isolated a substance from the opium, which he labeled morphine, and he named this. Listen to this: after the god of dreams, the god of dreams. His name is Morpheus. Some of you may know him. From the Matrix, right? Morpheus, the god of dreams. Coming out in three days. Three days, new Matrix popping. Who's a Matrix fan? Hashtag thumbs up. <laughs> <laughs> morphine. And so he, he called this stuff morphine. And soon it became a mainstay of U.S. doctors for treating pain, anxiety, respiratory problems, as well as a consumption and female elements. Morphine was commonly used as a painkiller during the Civil War. Check this out. During the Civil War. So many soldiers became dependent on opiates that the post-war morphine addiction was known as a soldier's disease. In the 1800s, we have an opioid epidemic. People are getting prescribed this for their fight and battle in war. After the war, they started calling this a soldier's disease because they were so addicted to opiates. In 1853, guess what was invented? A hypodermic needle. <laughs> <laughs> Yay! <laughs> Which was good for doctors, right? They could administer this stuff during surgical procedures. And this gave the rise of the medicalization of opiates. Heroin was synthesized as a derivative from morphine in 1898, and the German chemical company Bayer offered heroin as a cough suppressant. And it was offered as a non addictive substitute for morphine. Weird, huh? So this little. We've, we we kind of see this formula already beginning to play out. Hey, let's change the formula, call it something else, mix a little bit of aspirin with it, and we're going to say it's non-addictive. AKA and paragoric. Paragoric. And they I, make I had all that as a child. kinds of money. What is paragoric? Maybe explain that. The paragoric's just that. It's the oxycodone stuff that they'd sell. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> but my grandma used to put it on the baby's gums when we were teething. And my mom came to pick me up one time and I was like, out of it. <laughs> and she was like, what did you do to my kid? My grandma's like, what? I just gave her some paragoric. Uh, my mom had to look that up. She's like, you gave her basically heroin. <laughs> so, yeah. That's crazy. Your grandma. No wonder all the kids grew up to be drug babies. Right. <laughs> we were all given opiates as babies. What do we do now? Benadryl? Uh -huh. <laughs> Oxycodone became widely available when it was approved by the FDA in 1950, right? Since the early 1960s, abuse of prescription opioids containing oxycodone has been a major concern in the United States. And so this is how it goes, right, for a while. Opiate use in the 21st century, and then all of a sudden, Purdue's aggressive marketing kicks in. And I want to show you what these guys did, all right? They went out and created videos, had huge sales rep parties to get people pumped up to go and sell. Look at this video that I found, and maybe you've seen it before, but this is one of their parties and what they looked like. Guys, you know, as far as the Purdue Frederick Sales Organization is concerned, it's a high energy sales organization. It's one of the best sales organizations in the pharmaceutical industry. They're hard driving. And if we're going to write a song for these folks, it's a song that's got to smoke. <laughs> Purdue, are you ready to rock? Yeah. Yeah. I want to tell you a story now, people, about a company called Purdue Bread. 
600 sales reps pitching healthcare providers all over the country, using junkets and parties to lure doctors to write scripts. Purdue's pitchmen bank $40 million a year in bonuses. At the turn of the century, Oxycontin sales exceeded $1 billion a year, passing Viagra as America's most profitable drug. Damn. So cringy. That was a cringy video. <laughs> but that just goes to show that these greedy guys set up a mass marketing scheme. And this goes all the way back to Arthur. Arthur Sackler, way back in the 1940s and 50s and 60s, the Sackler family. And that is our introduction to opiates and the Sackler family today. Next week, we will get a little deeper into the history of the Sackler family and how Purdue came about and how his grandfather's Arthur Sackler, his marketing strategies of that day led into the 1996. That video came out in 1997 where they were pumping everybody up. Go out there and sell Oxycontin because we just made $40 million in bonuses. They're all about the money. And so now that it's 8 o'clock, I'm going to let Fleece say what's up for a minute as we switch gears and jump into our book, Staying Sober. Yeah, to the latecomers. What's up, Teeter? Started off early tonight just so we can get a little more in. That's why. What's up, Petey? Hashtag share squad. Glad you're here. Yeah, thank you. Share us out. Yeah, supersized episode tonight, John. You got that right. <laughs> uh, yeah, he announced it in the Discord, bro. <laughs> <laughs> and then at 8 30 we're going to bring bill and tracy on and we're going to go through some questions from the discord we got one good question and then some crap talk on leslie <laughs> well we're going to crap talk on leslie uh you know brad <laughs> uh lauren said i lost four family members to overdose two uncles an aunt my grandma i found my aunt in her house dead from fentanyl oh lordy that's sad i have an uncle that overdosed it was, it was heartbreaking just watching my cousins have to deal with that. Man alive. Everybody's going to quit using drugs one day. Whether you have a heartbeat or not afterwards is up to you. <laughs> Screw him, she says. <laughs> 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 Discord hates Teeter. Bullcrap, Teeter. You're a tech guy. You just don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> Matt Crabtree, what's up? You're welcome. It is disgusting. And the deeper we get into this every Sunday, we're going to start our show with 30 minutes earlier every Sunday now from 7.30. So that first half hour, we can dive in to the Purdue family and see how that they have skated these three felonies that they've been ch that Purdue was charged with and how they are sitting on $11 billion claiming, oh, no, it's all good. Oh, it's all good in the hood over here. So post-acute withdrawal. They are experienced by most recovering persons, I would say 90 percentile, but they are, but they're very, but they vary in severity, right? If you've been using drugs for two years and you're coming off of drugs compared to somebody that's been using drugs for 10 years, you know, you can imagine the, the post-acute withdrawal severity is going to be different. What is a post-acute withdrawal? It's withdraws that your body is healing from. You know when you got a you got a big cut on your arm, you go get stitches from the doctor. You got to put a wrap around it. Once the wrap goes around, uh you can take the wrap off of it. The stitches are still there. You finally get the stitches out, it starts healing up, then it kind of gets itchy. And then it, you know, the whole healing process of a cut. Your body goes through a similar thing when it is healing. The brain has to rewire itself, the organs, the liver, the gut, the, the microbiome in your belly has to be fixed. All this stuff has to heal. And it takes a year to two years, depending on how hard you went. Um, and during that process, you're going to feel a little out of it, or a lot out of it sometimes. And that is post-acute withdrawal. And understanding those symptoms and taking action to fight those is going to help you continue this growth through recovery. Because the relapse syndrome is and equals post-acute withdrawal minus symptom management. You got to manage these symptoms. And how do you do that? You do that through education, taking your 10th step, doing the 12 steps, getting around people who've been there, done that. And with a tribe, picking up the phone and calling people when you feel these types of things. It says, if you are experiencing post-acute withdrawal and you do not do whatever is necessary to effectively manage those symptoms, the relapse syndrome will eventually take over. The symptoms will build, grow, and progress. There are many subtle warnings and many changes in thoughts, emotions, and personality that occur before you lose control. Eventually, you will lose control of yourself. You will be going down a progression that will lead to alcohol or drug use or to the same, to some other acute emotional or physical reaction unless something is done to interrupt 
the progression. So you want to get aware of it. You want to understand yourself, your body, and what you're going through. What drug of use did you use? What was your drug of use? Look at what its effects and side effects are long term and understand that all of a sudden when you feel like this, you can go, oh, that's because I was doing drugs. Oh, now that I recognize that I feel like this, I can do this to combat it, right? So that you're not thinking you're crazy, getting depressed and running down the hill until you end up back at the drug dealer's house because that's going to relieve the pain. You know, recovery is a painful process because it hurts to heal. It takes a long time to heal. You got to be patient. Us addicts want in, want instant gratification and recovery is not instant gratification. It's it's learned over time. And now I look back after my two, two years and three months or whatever I've been sober and I see the reward system in myself has completely changed. I go and work out and I feel good. I have a meeting with my friends and I feel good. I get up early and I read my book and I'm rewarded. Like today we went hiking. Some of you saw us on our Facebook. We went hiking and that felt good. I've never gone out and done something in recovery and came back and go, dang it. I wish I wouldn't have done that. That was dumb. You know, every time I go to a meeting, I'm glad I went. Every time I go work out, I'm glad I did it. Every time I go hiking, I'm glad I did it. Yeah. You say? It's fun. Nothing. I was just leaning forward. Oh, they were gonna say something. I was letting you take a breath. It's <gasps> giving you. <sighs> so you thought I was gonna say something. I did. So you could take a breath. So I could vape. But clarification, real quick. Seven thirty until further notice. Right. Yep. Ish. <laughs> seven thirty <laughs> until further notice. <laughs> it might be seven. Just kidding. <laughs> You'll know next week. Hiking for the wind, Jess. Heck yeah, you know it. Yeah, hiking's fun. I love hiking. And it's a good thing for our dogs too. Now that winter's here, we don't get out. Like every morning we're usually out. I usually take them running or something, but it's been pretty cold. So my dogs are in here for two days all cooped up, running around, chewing stuff up. Like we got to get them outside. Yeah, that's the only bummer part about not having like a house is a backyard. Yeah. So what is Teeter saying? Maybe it's recovery from drinking, but my tummy goes into knots randomly. I blamed anxiety, but now that you mention it, it might be from drinking. It could be from drinking plus a bad diet as well, Teeter. You know, you got to change. And I, I don't I'll think I'm not saying change everything overnight. Take baby steps in the direction, but change things in a positive direction. Exercise, eating healthy and fixing your relationships. And John is every Sunday, 930, 730, 630. Uh, until further notice as well. <laughs> In case you guys were wondering. In case you always just wondered. It is important for you to always be aware that relapse process does not only involve the act of taking a drink or using. It is a progression that creates an overwhelming need for alcohol or drugs. It is this progression that we call the relapse syndrome. It is possible to interrupt this progression before the warning signs are obvious. If nothing is done until you are showing obvious signs, it is usually very difficult to interrupt the relapse syndrome. So in recovery, you want to take steps to stay ahead of your, of your post-acute withdrawal, of your addictive mind, your stinking thinking, your depression. Take steps that are going to help get rid of that. Anything I've ever done in my life as far as construction or when I was a wage leader on base or when I'm writing things, I always try to like, let's use stucco for example. I'm going to wrap this house with paper so that I can put wire, cement, and then color on it, right? So what can I do now that's going to make the last job even easier? So I'm going to make a nice place around the house that's flat so I can set my scaffold. I'm going to set my scaffold so nice and tight that I don't have to touch it again until we're ready to go. And now I'm going to wrap my paper in a way that all the windows are work out perfect so I never have to come back to it. Each step of the process, you want to stay ahead of the next step so that it just becomes easier and easier and easier. Yes. Uh, pugs. Don't jump straight into Swiss chard, Matt Crabtree. <laughs> what does that mean? I don't know. <laughs> okay, Nicole Crabtree and Matt Crabtree, are you related? Are we the same? <laughs> It is possible to interrupt this progression before the warning signs are obvious. If nothing is done until you are showing the obvious signs, it is usually very difficult to interrupt the syndrome. Because you have already lost control of your judgment and your behavior, you don't want to lose control of your judgment, the way you're perceiving things. You're going to take things wrong. Somebody's going to look at you and you're going to think they're pissed when they're really not. 
you know, and your behavior is going to get out of control. Relapse is not usually a conscious choice. Studies have shown that relapsing people are generally not consciously aware of the early warning signs of their relapse. Later, when they look back, they can identify what went wrong. Always take your day at the end of the day and do an inventory and look back over your day each and every day and say, what could I have done better? What went right? What went wrong? If it went wrong, <clears throat> get rid of it. If it went right, double up on it tomorrow. So, but at the time it was happening, they were unaware that the problems were building and growing. Oh my gosh, they're building and growing. The signs of relapse develop on an unconscious level. You will not know that they are occurring unless you learn unless you learn to bring the warning signs into your conscious awareness. How do you do that? You study what the drug has done to your body. You get around other addicts who experience the same things. As soon as you start feeling crazy or whatever, you call and talk to somebody. Hopefully you've taken and made yourself a relapse prevention sheet, right? What are your goals in life? What are your triggers? What are your behaviors that indicate that you're possibly going to go down that path to use? And when you feel these things start to happen, you have a list of people who you would call. Who is the first person that you would call if you were in trouble, if you were about to relapse, if you don't feel good or you're sad? Who's that first person? Put that person on the next. If they don't answer, who's the next person you would call? If that person doesn't answer, who's the next person you would call? Make a list of about 12 to 15 different people and you can use the Discord. You can use Facebook groups as these types of places to reach out to. And when you start feeling this way, you work yourself down that list. You actively pursue in action your recovery until how bad do you want it? You got to put aggression into Real it. You got to make war. Make war. Make war. <laughs> That's one of my favorites. Me too. Make war. So you guys are like husband and wifey then? Because that's what you make it sound like. But Nicole makes it sound like your brother and sister. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're related. <laughs> He's like, love of my life. <laughs> Meh. <laughs> Just kidding. Getting mixed signals. <laughs> <laughs> What's really going on? Uh, Jeanette says, my tummy goes in knots every time I look at Alan. Aww. Make war with your addiction. Make war with the desire to be weak and less. Make war yes, with make depression. War. Make war and, and what happens during war? Right? You're walking around, your, your ears, your eyes, every all your senses are become completely aware. You hear a branch snap. You're looking over your shoulder, right? You're completely ready for anything that may come your way. In your recovery, you need to do the same type of thing. Whatever's coming my way, I'm going to battle it with the right tools. Here you go. 12 steps. Oh, here you go. Step 10. Oh, I just screwed up. Here's a step eight. Oh, crap. Character defect. Step six and seven. You know, and get after it. We're all three. <laughs> <laughs> really? They're hillbillies. I knew it. <laughs> She's my wife and inappropriate best friend. <laughs> <laughs> and we're still like four or five week issues out on the hats, Matt, as soon as they come in, coming your way. Yes. Didn't forget, but we'll either be black or <laughs> navy green. <laughs> no, not navy green. It's not a color. <laughs> forest green. So tell me black or forest green. Similar to this color here. Similar. Mm, yeah. A little darker. <laughs> I am. I am teeter's anxiety. <laughs> <laughs> Me and Gage team, no Facebook. I don't get it. I don't know what's going on with that one. John says, be one with yourself, love yourself, make yourself stronger physically, mentally, because when the masks drop, when the cabin pressure drops, what do we do, everybody? Put it on yourself first, right? And then you put it on your loved one. Boom. See, put it on yourself first, then the rest of the row. Yeah, you got to take care of yourself to take somebody, care of somebody next to you. There's no doubt about it. So the progression of this relapse stuff we're talking about, when it can occur, it can occur easily without any effective recovery program. Oh, it can happen sweet. easy. If you're not working a program, good luck. Yeah, without effective management of the post-acute withdrawal symptom, it's going to happen. The process usually begins with what? Number one, change. Change is a normal part of life, but a major cause of stress. The change may be an external event that forces you to respond in some way, or it can be a change of thinking or attitude. What changed? What changed in life? I know I got all weird and pissy with fleece the other night, and she's like, what changed? I'm like, oh, 
what did change? <laughs> but I was just riding with it. I was being an asshole. <laughs> I was like, something's different here. <laughs> then I had to throttle back. Oh, shit. I better work my program and think about it. Oh, sorry, babe. I love you. Sorry, I was being weird. But yeah, the fact that she was there to help me say what changed, like that that's it. Like once you start being an asshole, it's nice to have somebody in your corner that can get you out of your funk because I wasn't getting out of my funk. It's like I was blind. I was being a prick. I was just being a jerk to her. She's like, what changed? Oh, shit. Well, let me contemplate this for a minute. That's a good question. Good <laughs> questions. <laughs> because what? Straight change produces stress to which you are apt to overreact and for which you probably have a low tolerance. Crap, there's stress. I'm going to overreact because I have a low tolerance to stress. As stress levels are elevated, there is a normal tendency to deny the presence of stress and triggers. What? Denial? I thought denial was only an addiction. No, it follows you right into recovery. Mm. Denial mechanisms that are a part of addictive disease, right? You begin to deal with stress the same with the same kind of denial you once used to justify using. I don't have a problem. I can handle it. Everything's all right. And you're saying this sober, abstinent from drugs. Denial follows you right into recovery, and you use the same type of denial to justify your attitude, stinking thinking, and behavior, which will inevitably get you to justify, I could just take one more one more go this weekend. It'll be all right. And if anybody needs anybody to talk to or to reach out to, Alan has offered. Hit up Alan. Yeah, put Alan on your list. He'd be a good guy to talk to. Alan's a cool guy. We like him. Heck yeah, I love Alan. Mm, Jeanette says, got to be aware of stresses in your life. Two can definitely start the circle of relapse. I had a using dream the other night. I think, I think due to work. Oh, I think due to work stress. Probably. Oh, yeah. Probs. Yeah. Story time. Ooh, stories. Kenneth. He was 47-year-old man who was married with two teenage children. He had seven years of abstinence. He had a firm conviction that he would never drink again, even if it killed him. He had worked for the same railroad for 17 years. For several years, Kenneth had worked the night shift and had enjoyed having less supervision at work and his days free to do odd jobs for extra cash. Because of manpower cutbacks, he was changed to the day shift. The shift change created a lot of stress for Kenneth because he had trouble sleeping when he was used to being awake. And then there were the financial problems caused by giving up his extra jobs. In addition, he was around his family more, and it was difficult to get used to the children's noise. Huge change. I work the night shift. There's hardly any management. During the day, I get to wake up. Everybody's gone. The house is quiet. I can do odd jobs. Got more money coming in. Now you switch all that around. You got to get up early. You got to make sure you're going to bed early. The kids are loud. It's nighttime. Everything changed. Schedule change is very difficult, especially when it in, involves your sleep. Mm -hmm. When people close to him noticed that he seemed more uptight than usual, usual Kenneth repeatedly told them, I'm going to be okay. I just need time to adjust, which is true. But before long, Kenneth began to feel like the children were deliberately making noise to irritate him. It seemed that his wife picked fights and his mind always seemed clouded and confused, making it even little decisions more difficult. Kenneth did not like the people at the evening AA meeting as much as those at the noon meetings. So it became easier to skip meetings. Uh oh, that's not good, Kenneth. Although usually a quick call to a friend to share a joke, the calls and the jokes came less and less frequent. It seemed that he didn't take anything. It didn't take anything just to set him off and to trigger his verbal abuse. Kenneth's kids became, began to be around less and less when he was home. He's like, oh, dad's home. We're out of here. His wife withdrew and confided in her sponsor that she didn't know how much longer she could stand it. My husband's home from day from night shift and he's a freaking total prick now. I don't know how much longer I can take it. So it's affecting everybody and everything in his life. Finally, Kenneth's AA attendance stopped altogether. He no longer met his buddies at the cafe for coffee, and they didn't go out to dinner with his friends. He seldom ate with his family and began snacking rather than having regular meals. Now he's screwing up his body. Because of his financial frustrations, Kenneth sold his good truck and bought one much more older, and it cost twice as much to maintain. He decided to have... The driveway repaved rather than to have his washer and TV repaired. 
His bad judgment made his financial problems worse, and it created other life problems. He began to oversleep and call in sick rather than go to work. Man, this is just a snowball going right out of control, isn't it? Kenneth's wife reached the point that she was threatening divorce. His job had given him one written and two verbal warnings, and his son moved in with a friend to avoid the hassle. Still firmly committed to not drinking. Well, that's good. He's abstinent. Kenneth began to plan his suicide. That's bad. That's stinking thinking depression. If I just make it look like I fell under the train. That was his thoughts, man. If you if you notice what we're looking at here is we're looking at a guy, something major in his life changed, and he didn't do anything to continue his recovery or to, to deal with these problems in recovery. And he was in denial first thing about it. I'm okay. You know, I know you guys are concerned, but I'm okay. Instead of saying, no, I don't think I am. How can we work through this and get out of this denial? He remained in denial, though he was not drinking. And now look at him. He's ready to jump under a train and make it look like an accident. Kenneth's wife became aware that relapse can be interrupted and gave him the choice of treatment or divorce. He chose treatment. He chose life instead of suicide. He sought treatment for his relapse, even though he had not taken a drink. He went to treatment for relapse even though he didn't take a drink. One of our good friends from the other side of hell podcast, his name is will awesome dude. Tune into the other side of hell podcast. Any chance you get, they got great dudes, great stories. We just, I've been going to the gym with him on and off and getting to know him better, but he just came out of a six year relapse is what he calls it. You know, he, or maybe three year. I can't remember the exact, but he goes, I've been living as a dry drunk without God living in denial. And he, and he just kind of like woke up to this and he started working his program a little harder, talking to his sponsors and stuff better. And, and he's, he's changed his whole recovery program around because he realized that even though he hadn't taken a drink, he was in relapse. He's like, dude, I was full blown relapse up here. And I've been there in early recovery. I've gone through full blown relapse as far as judgment and, and action and, and the way I deal with people and the decisions I've made, but try not to do that anymore. Your turn to talk That's for a while. My turn to talk. I love talking. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, John says, fear can paralyze us, whether it's our past, depression, our future anxiety. The best we can do is live for the moment right now. The best moment. Yeah. Living in the now. That's what Link likes to say. It's true. Do it, Linky. Do it. Um, the living in the now. Living in the now. Living in the now. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> what was that? Can I, can I say something? Yeah, yeah. please do. All right. Um, tomorrow is the future, which is a mystery. Yesterday is the past, and it's gone. Today is right now, and it is a present. Oh, it's like Christmas. Yeah. Every day is like Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Leslie said, me, dry addict for four years. Oh, puppy. Oh, hi, Jackie. Jim says, what we do in recovery today will make tomorrow's recovery possible. Yeah. I like that one. <laughs> the kids are here. And the puppy. All <laughs> They're all here. Exactly Green-eyed cat said, Kenneth didn't see it coming. Don't be like Kenneth. <laughs> <laughs> Don't be a Kenneth. Poor Karen. Don't be a Kenneth or a Karen or a Chad. <laughs> That's what I've heard. High fives, Link. Boom. There you go, Ellen. Okay. I think it's time for our uh, third segment. Spot on. It is a gift. And if we wake up thinking that way first and foremost in the morning, like, <gasps> I just took a breath of fresh air and I'm alive. What a gift. And then continue your day on approaching everything as a gift. You know, the warm water, the bed you crew, crawled out of, you know, and, and man, life gets better. And then look for somebody to help. Send somebody a text on, you know, it's a positive text. Yeah. I think he stole our, our Zoom. <laughs> he always is still in the Zoom. He's got the clarity. <laughs> <laughs> I got the face. He's got the bot. <laughs> so as you know, we have added a third segment. That's why we started at 7.30 today. Boom. So 7.30 to 8 is now going to be history of drugs and stupid Sackler family because we're cleaning up their mess. And then 
8 to 8.30, we're going to go through our educational books. And then 8.30, we get to hear and talk to Bill and Tracy and go over the questions from the Discord. So without any further ado, let's bring on our amazing guests. The Bill and Tracy Show! Da, da, da. <laughs> Hi, y'all! What's up, How my dudes? I've missed my tribe this weekend so much. Um, Where have you been? What have you been doing? What are you, what are you missing us for? I went to California and um, I took some time to relax and unstress and really think about my goals. And around my birthday, I always uh, set up my goals for the next year, you know. And so I got a lot of time this week to think about it. And you know, one of the most profound things I came across this week was I got to give myself permission to start saying no. Um, I put way too much in my schedule. And anytime anybody wants some help or anything, I always say yes. And so I'm going to give myself permission to disappoint people sometimes in order for me to find more joy, more strength stress relief and to be able to focus on some of the things I love. You know, I, I hadn't picked up a paintbrush for over a year until we went to paint together. And that was something I used to do quite often to relax. And um, so that is my goal. My big goal for this next year um, is to unwind a little bit and say no and focus on self care. Because when I fill my cup, then I can pour it onto those I love more. And um, <laughs> I want to work with RA to grow it and everything. And so, you know, just going to stay focused and see what okay. God's got for us. What about you, Bill? Uh, I spent most of the weekend trying to finish getting the, the heater and the air conditioner in the house. But we got brand new stuff now. Yeah, uh, nice. Old goals. <laughs> um <laughs> I've been listening to you guys talk about the relapse prevention and, you know, um, you, you talk about people saying fine and you know what fine means, right? Freaked what? out, insecure, neurotic, and emotional. Freaked out, insecure, <laughs> neurotic, and, and emotional. An addict, that's a really unsafe place to be. Yeah. Um, I'm going to write that down. <laughs> <laughs> um, Freaked out. Insecure. Insecure, insecure. neurotic, and emotional. And, you know, that's like when we first got together, that was one of the things he'd always, he'd say, how you doing, babe? And I'm like, I'm fine. <laughs> I don't say that no more. <laughs> <laughs> and I was pretty freaked out, insecure, neurotic, and emotional when we first got together. Um, uh, I wasn't completely clean when we started dating. I was still smoking pot. And, um, yeah, uh, not a good thing. And when we moved our relationship a little further along and I heard his story, I realized for a meth addict like he was that if I brought pot into his house, it could send him completely out. And I had to really start looking at myself and what I was doing. And, you know, pot is a drug. For an addict like me and an addict like him, we can't moderate. And I could sit there, they gave me a medical license and everything like that. And I had to come to the realization that I, anything that alters my mind is not okay for me. And um, I'm doing really good without it. Oh, we just lost our lights. <laughs> it's all good. Did you kick them again? Uh, it might come on. Sometimes yeah. it takes a minute. <laughs> it's all good. No worries. We can see you. Uh, it's fine. Yeah. Um, the whole relapse prevention thing, you know, I, 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 I am a retread, so I, I'll just come right out and say it. I knew I was going to relapse before I did it and I didn't go talk to anybody about it. And, you know, picking up that 10,000 pound phone when, when you don't feel good enough is hard, but it's worth every second of it. Um, when I came back in this last time, um, I had lied through my whole first section when, when I was actually trying recovery and that's part of the reason i kept relapsing is because i wasn't i wasn't getting honest with people about the fact that i was doing stuff i mean i collected from 30 days right well 60 days on i collected chips that weren't real you know what i mean oh man yeah yeah and, and the lie just kept building and building and building and pretty soon i was right back out the door again and this time when i came in 
uh, one of the things that I realized at about three weeks clean is that I had to get up and get honest with all my friends about the fact that I didn't collect not one, may, maybe one chip that was actually real in the first time that I that, that I was there, you know. Um, uh, it doesn't matter if it's a little white lie or not. For an addict of my kind, to lie about something like that is going to slowly build up until I'm just going to push myself out the door and not feel worthy of being clean. You know, that's, that's true. That, that's what I did anyway. That's false pride at its at its most right there, huh? Well, Smiling, right grabbing right. that chip. Tell right. us how you did it. And then you got to sit there and lie. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, <for sure. laughs> Man. So, yeah, don't I, I don't suggest anybody do what I did the first round. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, on the other hand, that, re, that when I came back in the last time, I was truly ready to do whatever it took. Um, you know, I I. I prayed about a sponsor for, I don't know, three weeks. And then finally the light come on, ding, 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 ding. This guy was who you were using before, before you even went out and he wasn't your sponsor. So maybe you ought to just try and cult cultivate a relationship with somebody that you already trust. Yeah. 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 I've done the steps six different ways and probably the first four times that I did them, I was trying to find the right answer or what I thought my sponsor needed to hear, you know, I didn't realize that I wasn't being honest with myself about where I really was at and what I needed to do. And since I came to RA and we started doing this relapse prevention book, it, my recovery is profoundly grew, you know, going back into your childhood and teen years and the things that we are learning in the local program has totally changed my recovery and even got me to a new newer level of realness and i, I just up. absolutely love what yeah, we do hold up. <laughs> <laughs> level up <laughs> that's been the theme of us last week at our local program is when somebody does something awesome we uh hit a little you know the mario doo -doo 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 -doo. <laughs> we're leveling up right on um yeah yeah go ahead no go ahead <laughs> the, the other thing that i was thinking about as far as le relapse prevention um when i got to my third step my sponsor made me write a list of 20 things that i would do for my higher power every day for my recovery um and, and i kept telling him i can't do it i can't do it you know I don't know that i couldn't come up with 20 things that that i will do every day for my recovery now that i've got a routine um, and, and here's the thing that's worked the best for me is the fact that if I'm really out of whack, guess what? There's probably at least three or four things on that list that I'm not doing. Oh yeah. Um, and, and it's not, you know, that, that list doesn't have to be specifically to your higher power. I mean, that my, my sponsor had me write it out that way so that I was asking my higher power to help me get through my day. You know, um, the first thing that I do is I try to pray then I try to meditate. And then from there, it's just, you know, help somebody, stuff like that. Um, and, and all it takes is just two or three days of not doing that. And it might not be part of my routine for a while. And then I wonder why I'm out of whack, you know? Yeah. Every time I'm that far out of whack, I'm not doing quite a bit of that list. So 20 things that you will, you will do for your recovery? Yes. Okay. And I, that's part of my goal too for 2022 is to find, find, uh, look at that schedule that I have. And is this benefiting my recovery? Is this benefit me being of service and really refine my morning routine and my night routine so that I can be more productive and, you know, cause my recovery has got to come first, God here, my recovery, and then my family and, you know, we talk about that, the we, and, you know, that we that I left God out for so long kept me dry. Um, I just couldn't understand why I just kept struggling so much, why we get in situations where um, people around me were using or something like that, and I would just go bat crazy. And now when people use or something around me, I can excuse myself and get out and do what I need to do for me, um, to feel okay. And picking up the phone is the biggest one telling somebody, 
You know, I was down in uh, California and I didn't realize that uh, marijuana was legal down there for recreational. And so I was walking down Mission Beach, just me and my little dog. There goes the lights again. (laughs) That's fine. We can see. um, uh, Some people started blowing smoke my way. And so I picked up the phone immediately and called Bill. And I didn't want to use or anything, but I knew that I was in a situation that I probably should not be alone. And so he FaceTimed me until I could get back to my car and get off the beach and and go meet up with my friends so that, you know, I was keeping myself safe and doing the next right thing. Because sometimes you just don't even think about what you're going to do when you come with those situations. And it's best not to be alone. 100 percent. Yeah, that's high risk, you know, being out of town. You know, that whole construction mentality. I don't know if you guys have it like I did, but, you know, you're out of the zip code. If you're not in the zip code, you're allowed to do whatever the hell you want, you know, and that kind of goes like in an addict mind. I'm not at home. I could get away. You could have totally got high that weekend and nobody would, you could have kept that to yourself and nobody would ever known, but you did the right thing. You called Bill, you talked to him until you got into a safe place and you're conscious, you're physical, everything about your recovery is better off for it. You know, I, 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 I bet you don't regret saying, I wish I wouldn't have called. Every time I take a step in recovery, like I was saying <laughs> earlier, I go work out, I call a friend. I never get off the phone and be like, dang, I wish I didn't do that. You know, okay. <laughs> I doubt you have any regrets about calling Bill. Nope, not at all. And you know, the, like the, my eating disorder too, like I did not go crazy and cheat. This is probably the first vacation I've ever gone that I it was an excuse to pick up a cupcake. And I made sure that I... Um, I have this challenge going on for myself right now and I've, I close my rings every day. So I made sure that I got to exercise in, I did it on the beach. You know, I did it, um, outside the condo where I was staying. I, I made time for what was important and taking care of my health is important to my recovery. Heck yeah. I want to shout out Mike Lopez real quick. One day sober, man. Woo-hoo! Go Mike. Every yeah. journey. Every big, long journey starts with the first step, right? And that's where he's at. We're proud of you, Mike. I know. Very cool. And putting it out there to the open public like that, that's huge, you know? You don't ever have to pick up again. Just call one of us. We'll walk you through it. (laughs) Here, let me drop the links to the Discord and stuff again. You get a hold of everybody. And you everybody know what time it is? (laughs) The Discord question of the day. Fleece is posting the link to the Discord. Make sure you jump in there. That's where the rubber meets the road here at the digital side of Recovering Addict, where people can actually get to know each other enough. They get mad at each other, which is good. And then you can practice, uh, you know, making amends and all that good stuff. Uh, The Discord is 24 hour support. Uh, We are actually expanding into another server called Recovery Underground. And we're starting to collaborate and work together with them so that we can help as many people as possible. Uh, Everybody's recovery is different. You know, what works for you is not going to work for me and vice versa. So we want to make sure there's a multitude of options available for the Mike Lopez is out there that just hit one day and he can find his place and his tribe and continue through this path and of sobriety and self-discovery and healing. Right. And so inside this discord, we have a little channel in there that's called comments for the live. And if you go in there and you comment during the week, we will address it like we are about to right now. And our first question in the discord is from Jim Hartley. He says, if the attitude that we have now is working in our life today, will the same attitude work in our recoveries? That's kind of a weird question for me. If the attitude is working now. I would, I don't see why it wouldn't work in your recovery unless something significant changes. The, the only thing I have to say about that is change is a constant what was working for me when I was first clean would not work for me today at all. No. No. So change is the only constant. You have to feel your way through things. And and that's one of the things that recovery does is help you to learn how to deal with your feelings. If you're feeling your way through it and being true to it, you're most likely going to be okay. Yeah. What, which kind of brings up another good point. Like I have two years and some months clean bills got, 
damn near two decades <laughs> in sober work and recovery, right? So the perspective on that question coming from somebody like me, which is very young in, in recovery, even though I've, I've made it two and a half years, pat on my back, that's, that's a lot of years, you know, two years is a lot. But I looked at that question and I couldn't even understand it, but Bill approaches it with, I couldn't do the stuff I was doing the first five years of my recovery and maintain recovery right now. And now I have to look at that and I look back and I go, whoa, yeah. If I look at my first six months in recovery, I couldn't do the same things I was doing then and maintain my sobriety now. So that's the awesome thing about getting into a tribe full of people who have Mike Lopez one day clean and Bill and Des, who we're going to shout out here, has uh, you know almost two decades clean and the wisdom that you can gain and why you need to be around people like this. So good question, Des, and an even better answer, Bill. Yeah. I know like if I, how I used to act and how I act now, like if I get in a situation and I get stressed out, kind of like that burrito story that you had, (laughs) you know, it, 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 classic burrito story, (laughs) burrito story, but you know, you, it, it bothered you to the fact that you acted that way and you talked about it and you worked through it and that's how your recovery grows. You know, if you would have just like, through a huge fit and like, just like let that build up a resentment. And then you just wanted to go back and like beat somebody up at the store or go cause a a huge scene Um, that puts you at high risk at relapse. You know, resentments is the first thing that will take alcoholics and addicts right back out. And so if I'm acting in anger or jealousy or envy or pride, those kind of things I have to be aware of that and catch myself that, oh, that's not not going to be good for my recovery, especially tomorrow, because I end up with a whole bunch of guilt and shame. And then that starts eating me. And then my mind's focused on the problem and not the solution. And the solution is to live in recovery every day. We only get 24 hours in a day. And it's a one day at a time. And if I bring stuff that I acted out on yesterday into today, my tomorrow's screwed. So true. Uh, an update on my burrito story. I have actually gone back to that store with a good attitude. Get a burrito. <laughs> Stupid burrito. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man. MC recovery wellness and relapse show says resentment. Number one offender. Heck yeah. It's so easy to build a resentment, especially if you're starting off with expectations, man. And now our second question of the night comes from kitty two, four, five. This person says, how can we learn to just sit with our emotions? This is a big part of recovery and the more tips and tricks we have, the better we will become. It is also hard to stay positive when life throws you curveballs at times. One more question. How do we fix the overspending some of some that we, that we do in recovery? <clears throat> so first, first question, how can we learn to just sit with our emotions? Well, for me, I had to learn to do that. Um, because if I did not sit in my emotion, I would automatically impulsively react and have a fit and act like the little six-year-old I was when I started using. And I've had to learn to sit in that emotion. And I actually call it Tracy's timeout. And I visualize myself in a teepee, putting myself in timeout and doing some breathing techniques and thinking about it. And my first thought is always wrong. So I do reach out and I talk to either my sponsor, I talk to Bill or Cheryl or Jake, somebody. And ask them about the situation, and then I properly respond. And I'll tell you what, my relationships now with my family, my friends, the people I work with are so, so much better because Tracy gets a timeout. That was, I was just going to reaffirm that if I'm the one that's out of whack, it's probably me that needs to take the time out. And I learned that actually more through parenting classes than anything. If my kid's frustrating me, it's me that needs to time out, not them. I need to 
five minutes so I can come and react like an adult to my child who's probably behaving better than me. <laughs> that's so true. Oh, that's like when reality hits you in the face. I'm the one being the child here. <laughs> Heck yeah, be still and know that I am God. That's a good Bible verse to meditate on. Be still and know that I am God. I've kind of felt like I've leveled up a little while ago. I'm not saying I've gotten there or reached anything, but I, I was able to have these weird emotions about two weeks ago of doubt and fear. And it was weird because my mind felt separated from my emotions. And I kind of like acknowledged, I'm like, wow, I, I feel this way, but I'm not scared. I feel this way. And I'm not, I, I was like the, the emotion itself was there, but the mind that usually, you know, runs with it didn't follow. It was just like, Hey, check it out. You're going through this emotion. What do you think the problem is? And I was like, well, am I hungry? Am I, did I sleep like crap? You know, what, what 20 things did I, out of that 20 things, what did I stop doing? And I was able to just kind of reel it in and I talked about it a little bit and it didn't get out of control. And I actually sat and I felt and acknowledged. So that's one thing I do is I'll feel and then acknowledge it. And then I say it out loud. And by saying it out loud, it just puts it, it puts it out there, takes the power out of it. And then it, you know, you say it to your friends and it takes and brings it to, to reality, you know, is, is what I'm feeling and seeing real? Is, is this something I'm just being, you know, am I overreacting to is my judgment off, you know, and, and, and then you get the encouragement, like, you know, from my buddy, Jake, he's like, Hey, yo, you're the Bible guy and I'm not, how come you're scared and I'm not, <laughs> you know? And, you know, it's like, sometimes you just need those good jolts of encouragement from your friends too. So acknowledge, feel, and then talk about it to a friend. Yeah. I call yeah. that feel, deal, and heal, you feel, know, deal and kill. It, yeah. heal. So when you start doing the feeling yeah. and then you start dealing with the emotion, you eventually start healing from those behaviors. And that can also get you through trauma and all kinds of things. Feel, deal, and heal. That's a good thing too. Oh, go ahead, Bill. Me personally, when I get like that and I get anxious a lot, you know, the, the, that it's self doubt for me, um, me not feeling like I'm good enough or whatever the case may be. And, and if, uh, you know, some changes that I made here recently and, and that's what's put me here. And, you know, when I finally just make the decision and, and it always seems to be this way, my higher power starts opening doors up. You were there when they opened up a few doors for me just a couple of weeks ago, just because I made the decision for this, you know, right. Um, I think really what it is, is addicts never feel like they're good enough or they're afraid of the change. Yep. Afraid of change is hundred percent. Faith is a real hard thing for us. <laughs> yeah, No doubt about that. All right. So on to her second question. Uh, it's also hard to stay positive when life throws you curveballs. So now we're dealing, okay, we're sober. We got a little bit of clean time under our belt. And now we're living life on life terms. And that's basically what we're trying to do is grow up and be adults and handle stressful situations. You know, your car breaks down, you get a flat tire, you uh, overdraw your money at the bank and you get hit with $25 overdraft or whatever that's called. How do you stay positive when life throws you curveballs? Hmm. My favorite is the term at least. Well, at least this didn't happen too. <laughs> yep. I got a flat tire the other day and we were talking about it in our local group at the moment, you know, this type of same topic and actually came from Geesh, like his attitude yeah. towards some stuff. And I took a picture of my flat tire and I said, well, at least it's not all four of them. <laughs> and I got, I got that from Geesh. That's probably my go-to phrase right there. Well, well, at least this didn't happen too. Um, my sponsor told me a story about a guy getting a flat tire and being all angry and all that stuff. And then when he got home, he found out that his parole officer was there to take him to jail. And he missed all that because he got a flat tire. <laughs> <laughs> Thank God for flat tires. <laughs> they do come in handy. You know, um, another thing I try to keep in mind, if, if you're an addict of my kind, you, you should probably be in prison. That's just all there is to it. Um, my sponsor and I sat down and added up all the times that I broke the law and how much time I should be spending in jail. And I'm very glad life is not fair. <laughs> I love that one. Yeah. If you ever upset about the fairness of life, look back over your addiction 
And how many crimes did you commit that you got away with total up, you know, literally look up the charges, look up how long you would be in prison, even if you made a deal. (laughs) Be grateful (laughs) life's not fair. (laughs) And for an addict like me, um, I always, I, for a long time was very negative in thinking. I had the Eeyore effect. I was always thinking, waiting for something doom and gloom to come. (laughs) And so what I what's part of my routine is I feed myself positive things all the time. I listen to motivational videos on YouTube. That's how I kind of come across you guys to begin with. Um, I read positive books. I think about what am I watching on TV when I have my downtime? Am I putting negative things in there and so forth? Because when I'm reading more inspirational things, participating around people that are more positive, thinking on, you know, putting things on on my mirror that are affirmations. Um, I I react to things when they come up a whole lot better. You know, Um, I'm going through a hard time right now. My dad's really sick and I have to, instead of being all doom and gloom and depressed about it, he's got a little girl now that he's proud of that I've built a relationship with him in recovery um, since I've been in recovery, that I'm actually daddy's little girl and we go ride motorcycles together and we've gotten very, very close and I get to hold on to that and I have faith whatever's going to happen is supposed to happen because my higher power is in control and that because of what I'm doing today, I don't have any regrets in my relationship with my father. He's um, he's an amazing man and it was me that was the problem and how I seen him instead of him being the problem, which I wanted to put all the blame on him because that's another thing I guess as addicts do. We, you know, always shooting the blame. It's everybody's fault that um, we pick up use and everything like that. So I uh, I'm learning extreme ownership, you know, and love and patience and tolerance whether people are in recovery or not, I get to be the difference. I get to be love and kind. Amen. Uh, I want to bounce something from what John V just said right there. He says, we can manifest anything. We should think positively as much as we can. And I put this little meme inside the discord and it says, it's easy to spot a red car when you're always thinking of a red car. Easy to spot opportunity when you're always thinking of opportunities. Easy to find reasons to be mad when you're always thinking of reasons to be mad. You become what you're constantly thinking about. Watch yourself. Watch yourself. Watch yourself. (laughs) That's so, so true. Um, When I stopped all the negative thinking and started thinking positively, then I started seeing all the beauty. You know, I seen the guy at the grocery store that was helping the little old lady out to her car and putting the groceries into it instead of me being the one that's impatient in line, wondering why is this taking so long? You know, it's, it's how we look at things and see things. It's gratitude. Yes. Practicing gratitude is huge. Well, what well, winning asks, how does someone go about getting a sponsor? I can only tell you my experience with it. Um, I was told to pray and then go to the rooms and look for somebody who had something I had and not necessarily the Maserati or the big pickup or the nice house, but somebody who spoke about being happy in their life, you know, because my personal opinion is my higher power just wants me to be happy, joyous and free. Amen. Uh When I hear somebody has a story and I can relate to their story and they have something that I want, that is huge. And I also, when I'm looking for, when I was looking for a sponsor, I didn't want somebody that was going to tickle my ears or I wanted them to be able to be straightforward with me. I wanted to make sure that they had, they worked a good recovery life too, you know, that they're, they're um, not being complacent, that they're showing up and suiting up and they're doing this thing, you know, and um, I'm very, very blessed. I, Sponsorship is very important and being able to sponsor people as well is huge. That's what, you know, it's, it works both ways. Oh yeah. I get way more out of my sponsees about what I need to change for myself than, than they probably <laughs> get from reading it to me. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you go on the Discord or the local um, Facebook page and say, Hey, I'm looking for a sponsor and ask to talk to somebody. 
Um, that's, I ended up with a sponsee in the UK, you know, because we have video and it's really cool that sponsorship can be worldwide. They don't have to be somebody like completely local, you know, pop in there. There's some people that share really good stuff and you might be able to relate to something in there. Yeah. So that's an option. Go around to local AANA or whatever type of meetings, uh, find somebody that has what you want, some peaceful life and attitude. Uh, or you can get on the discord or the Facebook page and just reach out to people and say, Hey, and then you don't always have to stick with the same sponsor and you don't only need to have one. You can have more than one, you yep. know, and then Marilyn, thank you very much for yes, the super thank chat. You, Marilyn. When I first got into recovery, I thought I was way sicker and everybody. So I went to like a A M A N A and I had sponsors in every single program and I would go and share my step one with each one of them. And, you know, and I, and I got a little bit out of everything and every sponsor that I've had over the years that I've been clean and sober, they have taught me something. I built relationships with these people and I'm still friends with these people. And it's okay to change sponsors sometimes as you change Sometimes you need something a little different and that's okay. It's not a personal thing. It's a thing. What is going to keep you clean and sober and growing in your recovery? And she says, thank you. <clears throat> and the last question we want to go f is from suicidal Christ, who is our one and only Brad. Brad he says me. today at 3.30 p.m. Here's a question for the live. Why is Leslie so cranky all the time? <laughs> <laughs> Leslie, will you please come on and answer? <laughs> Leslie, why are you so cranky? <laughs> yeah, once you join our Discord and you jump into our Zooms, you actually get to know each other. And there's a bunch of us in this chat right now that are speaking that meet together on the live streams. We get together in these Zoom meetings and man, we have a good time. We really get to know each other, talk crap and have a good old time. And that's what's happening here. Leslie and Brad know each other pretty well and we all <laughs> we all love to talk crap and that's what's going on there. But Leslie, cheer the fuck up. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> wow. And so now this is the new challenge of the week. Thank you to Bill. Oh, God. Write down 20 things that you will do for your recovery. What are 20 things that you're willing to do for your recovery? Billy, maybe you want to give a little of an explanation to why that was this week's challenge? Um, well, on my step three, my sponsor made me write down 20 things that I was willing to do for my recovery, for my higher power, for my recovery every day. Um, I suggest you start with getting up and dropping to your knees and inviting a power greater than yourself into your life is the number one thing. That's what I did. And then let it grow from there. Yeah. We do like devotions. We, we, we have native American background, so we smudge our house and, you know, <laughs> and I actually have a drum and I sing a song um, to greet the sun the as it song. comes, the morning song. And all that just kind of settles me, gets me awake and starts my day. And, you know, I'm, I'm excited to hear um, what 23, 20 things you guys come up with. I'd love to see some posts in the Discord about that. Um, it'll be incredible to see the different places in the world, what you come up with that you can do for your recovery. Uh, I'm, as you say that, I'm going to post uh, at everyone in the Discord in the Challenge of the Week tab. Um, post here 20 things or a few of the 20 things. Just drop a couple of what you will do for your recovery. Hi, Shree. One of my favorites is showing up for the local meeting Monday through Friday. That's changed my life hugely. We love having you there. And one thing the audience must know before we go anywhere, because it's getting late, is Bill, where did you get that t-shirt? You have fans. My daughter got it for me, actually. It was a birthday present. Mm -hmm. so Turn it on. Uh, can you see it? Look in here. Ah, move stage towards Tracy a bit. Nice. Heathen Nation. Oh, that is sick. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> God knows we're heathens, just recovered <laughs> ones. <laughs> Thank you, MC, for the super Thank chat. Thank you. Awesome. $10 bomb. Thank you very much. 
yeah, join that Discord and get to know us, and we'll get to know you. And if that's your channel, uh, Recovery Wellness and Relapse Show, dude, let's collaborate. Let's grow this thing. Let's give more people more options. <laughs> what? Oh, M. Gosh. 20. <laughs> Why you make us think, LT? <laughs> oh, this isn't my fault. This is Bill's fault, not mine. Oh. <laughs> you see how good we are at blaming people? Lot. I'll take that. <laughs> 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 Jeanette and Alan really love your shirt, Bill. Oh, well, thank you. It's a good thing to think of. What are 20 things you would be willing to do? I'm willing to get up and my my first thing I try to do is to open up devotional. Not Facebook, not Instagram, not my Gmail, but a devotional. Something positive, something that's going to set my mind in the direction of recovery. That, that's one thing that I do. Another thing that I do is eat a breakfast to keep my hungry, angry, lonely, tired, right? One thing I'm willing to do is shoot a text to a friend or hit Felice, hey, love, how's work? Uh, you know, what's one thing I'm willing to do? You know, think of those little things that you're willing to do in taking care of yourself and take care of yourself the way you would take care of your dog. You know, you would give your dog, you take your dog to the vet, and this is from a Jordan Peterson quote out of the 12 Rules for Life, and the veterinarian says, take care of your dog, right? Here, give your dog this medicine for 10 days. I'll bet you a hundred bucks. You're going to make sure your dog takes that medicine for 10 days. The leading reason why people don't benefit from modern medicine is because they don't take their medicine as prescribed because they're not treating themselves as somebody that they care about. Treat yourself as somebody you care about. And that's one thing you can do your free recovery today. I'm going to treat myself like I care about myself. That's true. Uh, Alan says he's willing to keep Jeanette straight <laughs> and Jeanette is willing to smack Alan every morning for her recovery. <laughs> you guys are funny. Awesome. All right. Let's say this uh, serenity prayer. The serenity prayer. Make sure V didn't drop it. Oh, John V says on this RA before Christmas, I just want to let you know. How appreciative of this community. You have done so much for me, and I love all of you. Yes, John, we love, love you too, John. brother. Thank you for being here. And, yeah, we will be back after Check Christmas. Check out the Venture Forward. Ready? Oh, is it after Christmas we'll be back? Yeah, that's something. Oh, we're out of focus again. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody out there have a very, very safe and sober Merry Christmas. Absolutely. There it is. God. Grant, Grant me the serenity to accept, accept the things I cannot change, change the courage to change the things we can, and, and the wisdom to know the difference. The difference. Amen. Amen. JV also says, we recover better together by staying safe, staying sane, staying strong, and staying sober. You are worth it. Good night, family. I worth love it. you. MC says, collaborate. Okay, I've been linking your videos, and sober is dope. And sober exposure and AA vids. Heck yeah. Thank you, brother. Yeah, let's do it. Reach out to me. Hit that Discord and we can chit chat. Until after Christmas next Sunday, you, you all. Do make sure you are figuring out 20 things you're gonna do for your recovery. That's this week's challenge. <laughs> do not put yourself in a high risk situation. Stay strong, work your programs, and remember we, we recover, recover better, better together. together.